Uh, a warm welcome to you, Stephanie Kelton. I, I assume you're sitting in New York. I am. I'm at my home uh, on Long Island. So yes, I'm in Island. New York. Yeah. No, in New York. It's New York, the state New York, and not the city yes. New York. Um, right. Warm welcome uh, virtually to Vienna, to the Bruno Kreisky Forum. It would be a pleasure. I already mentioned it would be a pleasure to have you virtually here. But in this moment, it's absolutely not possible. We are in Vienna, really in a lockdown in this moment. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, and also a warm welcome to everybody who is watching us here on uh, in this Zoom webinar and also on our live event on, on Facebook. Um, and also a warm welcome to my colleague Jutta Bichl, who is doing this all the technical stuff here, uh, and will and she will also help us from uh, uh, to put forward questions from the audience. Uh, you can uh, you can write in the chat or you can write also in the commentary function uh, of uh, Facebook, and uh, Jutta will take some questions, cluster them, and put it forward uh, to Stephanie Kelton at the in the last 15 minutes of, uh, of this hour. Um, uh, Stephanie Kelton is professor of economics and uh, public policy at uh, Stony Brook University in New York. She is one of the uh, most well-known voices of the modern monetary theory, which is a passionate discussed uh, uh, ec a macroeconomic uh, theory in the moment in the recent years. She is also author of the deficit myth the recent book, I, I assume it is published in, in spring. It was published in spring. Uh, so it's some month. June, yeah, summer. June. June. Yeah, in the summer. So it's it's really quite a fresh book. Um, uh, the Deficit Myths. And she served also as a chief economist at the US Senate Budget Committee. In fact, as an advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders, who is one of the most well-known <laughs> senators uh, of the US Senate, especially here in Europe, or the, or the most uh, uh, known uh, senator here in Europe for, you, our, for us Europeans. And recently, she was also at the Economist uh, Consulting Board, uh, however it's called, of the presidential candidate, Joe Biden. Um, so. Uh, my first question, we, we will talk about uh, the situation now and we will talk about the uh, modern monetary theory and uh, about your book, but let me start uh, with this very press, uh, pressing uh, news question. Um, are you still uh, at the advisory board of, of Joe Biden? And uh, if yes or if not, how would, you, how would you comment on the situation now? And what have you do, do we have to expect uh, from a from the next weeks and months to come? And what have we to, uh, to expect from a President uh, Joe Biden? Well, okay, thank you so much. I'm really uh, delighted. I do wish, as you said, that I, that I could be joining you in person in uh, beautiful Vienna, but I'm happy to be able to do it this way. And, you know, with respect to the election, um, look, I, I think that much of the world is frankly, breathing a big sigh of relief mm -hmm. um, with the outcome of the election. Uh, Vice President Biden won the election and will become president of the United States. He will be inaugurated in January. So, um, you know, there are still some questions up in the air, like, for example, will the Democrats Democrats manage to flip two Senate seats in the state of Joel of the Senate. They retained control of the House. They did lose seats, however. But, uh, you know, implementing the Biden agenda is quite a bit easier if you've got the Senate and the House, right? When Donald Trump became president in, in, uh, after the election in 2016, the Republicans had the House and the Senate. And so in the first two years, huge tax cuts. So, you know, you can move a big piece of legislation. I think uh, Vice President Biden wants to see a big relief package to deal with coronavirus and the weak economy. He is indicating now that he'd like to see that done uh, very soon, even before he's inaugurated. Uh, it's not clear that Congress is going to pass something substantial, maybe not anything at all, but probably not something as big as what he would like. So when he walks in the door, 
in late January, I believe that he's going to be coming into office in, uh, in, econ in an economic environment where the wheels are starting to come off the economy again. And he's got to push for something very, very big. And if the Republicans have the Senate, it's, it's going to be an uphill climb for him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, but you don't have any you you don't have any fears that there isn't isn't a peaceful transition, uh, given that uh, President Trump didn't concede till now and talking about the stolen election. Well, he he often doesn't uh, stay with us in the real world. He creates <laughs> his own sense of reality. Uh, eventually, he's going to have to come to terms with the reality, which is that he lost this election uh, soundly, and um, he's going to have to leave. Now, how much you know uh, chaos he will stir up in the next couple of months is anyone's guess. Uh, I would never underestimate his capacity to you know go out with a uh, you know you know cloud of chaos, but. Uh, we'll get there. And in, and in terms of, you know, the Biden team and the work that I did over the summer, I was part of the uh, task force on the economy. And we worked for a period of months, uh, eight of us on the task force on the economy and others on different task forces on climate and healthcare and education and so forth. So we worked closely with people uh, from the Biden side. And That work completed over the summer. And since then, I have not been doing anything formal with the campaign. So to answer your earlier question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, you, you just mentioned uh, working on, a, on an economic program for the, for the years to come. Uh, so I'm already in, in, uh, at the beginning of the issues I want to talk uh, uh, with you um, uh, because uh, some very, uh, pressing issues are totally interconnected for sure uh, with uh, the issues of your book and the issues of, of modern modernary theory uh, because also we are now in a global economic crisis the, Europe, the corona crisis governments have to save the economy have to save uh, um, private companies uh, to, to avoid the tsunami of bankruptcies and insolvencies um, and to restore growth and uh, employment afterwards. Uh, they have to take a huge amount of money in their hands and have to run huge fiscal deficits. And so many people ask, uh, how should we pay for that? And uh, many people ask, uh, can we afford uh, that? So the question I would uh, put forward very simple to you is, can we avoid, avoid a global collapse? Well, yes, uh, we can. And, you know, it, it does become important, right, when we say, can we afford? It's important to define who that we is, right? Because not all countries have the capacity to do what the U.S. can do, what Japan can do, what Australia can do. I mean, governments are showing us in, they're giving us a very nice real world example of what they are capable of you know, mustering in terms of spending power when there is, you know, an emergency, a threat, a, something deemed a significant priority, Congress started spinning out multi-trillion dollar bills without hesitation, without concern for pay-fors and finding money and so forth. They simply wrote a bill. And, you know, in the case of, uh, of Congress here in the U.S., we got one very big uh, package, which was called the CARES Act which was Congress committing $2.2 trillion dollars to dealing with coronavirus and the economic fallout. Now, it wasn't nearly big enough, and pretty much everybody realizes that it wasn't big enough, but it was big compared to anything Congress had done before, right? And they did four bills. CARES Act was just the largest that made it through both the House and the Senate. Could they do more? Yes, the House passed what was called the HEROES Act. They were ready to go for $3 trillion more. I mean, they voted it, they got it out of the House. It was Mitch McConnell in the Senate who said, we want to take a pause. We're not going to consider that bill. We think maybe we've done enough. But there's nothing to prevent Congress from coming back with another $2 trillion or $3 trillion or $5 trillion. Whatever Congress decides to authorize will 
show up in the form of new spending, the money will be there. And, you know, it can do that because, um, you know, the government in this country has control of its own currency and its own monetary policy. There are countries around the world that don't enjoy that kind of, you know, control the monetary, have the monetary system that we have. And so the constraints are different. But, you know, as I said, countries around the world have already committed something like 11 trillion to coronavirus spending, right, deficit uh, spending and so forth. So, yes, we have the, the firepower, we have the fiscal capacity to do this, the major countries in the world and in Europe, with the backing of the ECB, which is the currency issuer uh, for countries in the Eurozone, uh, we can muster all of the spending power that's necessary to support economies, provide a bridge to the other side of the pandemic. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm right, but we have to assume that there are people in, in our audience now that are not really, uh, they are interested, but not not uh, not experts on, on macroeconomics. So um, put it at the, the question very simple, um, uh, the usual assumption <laughs> uh, of, ordinary people, but also of the traditional uh, macroeconomic series is that, uh, that, the, that, the, that the governments are taxing um, and it uh, takes the tax money to spend it. And if they have to spend more, they have to take the money a step from the financial markets. Uh, and then they are running a, a huge uh, uh, govern, uh, national debt. So uh, what is the other way or the, the new perspective, the totally uh, contrary perspective the mo modern monetary theory is putting on this general assumption. So, oh, yeah, okay, so you just laid out a sequencing, right? Let's talk about the sequencing, the order in which we think things happen, because you're right. The, the average person has been trained to think of the government's finances to the extent that we spend any of our time thinking about government finances, we've been taught to think about them basically the way we think of our own personal finances, right? The government runs a budget. I run a household budget. They basically work the same way. If you want to spend, you got to come up with money. Uh, I get my money from working and earning wages or salary. The government gets its money mostly through taxing, right? So the government raises revenue by collecting tax from the rest of us. That gives it some money. If it wants to spend more than it is currently taxing from the rest of us, then it has a shortfall, right? So I got to come up with more money now. So where do I get more money to finance the shortfall in my spending? Well, I go out, as you said, and I go to capital markets. I borrow the currency from somebody who has it. So we basically think governments have two options, right? Two ways to finance their spending. They raise revenue from taxes or they borrow. That gives them the money, which they can then turn around and spend into the economy. That's the way we sequence. Okay, so MMT comes along and says, hang on, if we really dig down and we pay attention to the actual mechanics of government finance, we understand the monetary operations, we can understand that the sequencing doesn't go like that. It goes spending first. The government has to spend its currency into someone's hands before they can have it to be able to pay tax or buy government bonds. So the proper sequencing really is, think of the government the way that I described the CARES Act working. The CARES Act was Congress writing a bill. A bill is a set of instructions. The bill, the CARES Act is Congress committing to spending $2.2 trillion that it does not have. Congress didn't go out and find $2.2 trillion. You know why? because it doesn't have to. What Congress has is something the rest of us don't have. Congress has, we could call it the power of the purse, right? The fiscal purse. Congress has the ability to issue the currency. It is the issuer of the US dollar. The government is the issuer of the currency, which means that Congress can write a bill sending instructions to its central bank, the Federal Reserve. And the bill says to the Fed, get ready, we are ordering up $2.2 trillion from you. You're going to make the payments that we have authorized on behalf of the US Treasury. So the Federal Reserve carries out those instructions. It makes the payments, how? 
Well, I'm sitting here talking to you on a laptop. Somewhere in the Federal Reserve are a lot of computers, and some of those computers are used to clear the payments that have been authorized by Congress. And those payments are cleared by typing, right, digitally um, numbers into the computer that show up as credits to some bank account. So when Congress did the CARES Act, Congress said, look, we're gonna send a $1,200 check to virtually every person in this country. $1,200 is coming your way. Where did that come from? It came from the instructions that told the bank, the central bank, go out and credit the appropriate bank accounts, right? People who uh, live in households making less than $150,000 a year, they're gonna get one of these checks. So the Federal Reserve said, okay, type the numbers in and lo and behold, you've got an extra $1,200 in your account. What Congress didn't do was go to China and ask for a loan to be able to do this. They didn't raise our taxes in order to come up with money to be able to do this. They did something different. They said, we're just gonna spend this money into existence and that's how it works. Uh, so the general uh, the assumption of a modern modern theory is that we don't have to tax to spend the other way it's the other way around we at the first time we have to spend uh, to have something to tax <laughs> uh, this uh, this sounds quite uh, not only astonishing but also quite uh, quite logic <laughs> because uh, if we think about uh, it's very clear that at the first, at the beginning of the rounds, the people had should have have money in their in their pockets uh, that they got from the state to pay their first, the taxes some hundreds of years ago. Uh, uh, that is uh, that is in a way easy to understand. Uh, but uh, do you, in a way, the the the, the horizon of your argument is that. Uh, for that reason, um, we don't really have to think about uh, paying for our initiatives because there is, in a way, the possibility to have free money. Uh, isn't this a little bit too much adventurous? Well, we're doing it. Okay? We're mm -hmm. doing it. European governments are doing it. Japan is doing it. The British government is doing it. Everybody's doing it. And so, you know, sometimes, uh, Congress approaches spending decisions differently, where it says, okay, if we want to do a trillion dollars of infrastructure spending, right, repairing, modernizing America's crumbling infrastructure, Congress could write a bill with two sets of instructions, right? One set of instructions tells the Fed, I want you to go out and credit the appropriate bank accounts. I'm gonna hire, we're gonna be paying contractors to hire construction workers and architects and engineers. We're gonna have equipment that we're gonna need, you know, cranes and concrete mixers and all that stuff. And we're gonna spend a lot of money doing infrastructure. So you're gonna be changing the numbers in people's bank accounts up. You're going to be typing the numbers in and paying for that spending. My second set of instructions that I'm writing into this bill tells you you're also going to be debiting some bank accounts. You're going to be changing the numbers down because we are going to raise taxes so that we're going to spend a trillion dollars into the economy, but we're also going to tax a trillion dollars out of the economy so that the impact on the deficit is zero. Right? We don't want to add to the deficit. So we give two sets of instructions. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Right, Congress can budget that way. And the reason to do it that way from an MMT perspective is to say, OK, the economy is currently at full employment. There are no idle resources. There are no unemployed construction workers, architects, engineers. All the equipment is being used by the private sector to build housing and commercial real estate. There's really no idle capacity. So if we were to authorize a trillion dollars of infrastructure spending without offsetting that spending, we're gonna cause inflationary problems, right? We're gonna to have to compete for those resources with the private sector. So the purpose of offsetting the spending is to say, I'm gonna remove some purchasing power from the economy so that, they, so that the private sector will spend less, allowing me to safely spend more. 
So it's not about a free lunch. I mean, the idle resources are either available or unavailable. And if they are available, then government can bring them into productive use by hiring to put them to use without competing for the use of those resources and bidding up their prices. So, you know, it's not it's not a free lunch in the sense that, you know, once you employ those resources, they're not available to use in other ways. So there are trade-offs. Um, but in a, in a sense, you know, there's nothing to nothing inherently irresponsible about the government spending without offsets as long as the spending won't create other problems in the economy, most importantly, an inflation problem. Uh, so uh, that's also a question many people have with that situation we are now in. Uh, we are now in a situation of uh, uh, running huge deficits. I think Austria will have a 10% uh, uh, budget deficit in this, in this year. Um, and spending huge and taxing nothing <laughs> uh, uh, so that this might be a, a reason for inflation and that we have to expect uh, inflation but your point of view would be or your argument would be uh, that uh, we don't have to be too much uh, in sorrow for about uh, inflation uh, in a situation where there is so much huge uh, so so huge unemployment and so many uh, technical resources, uh, companies uh, not used. Uh, am I right? That would be my first question. And second, uh, is this really a special idea of modern modern theory? theory? So, okay, y yes, you're right. Uh, and no, this is not uh, unique. This is not a <laughs> unique insight to MMT. Okay, that's that. that is certainly true. So any, I think you said to me earlier, maybe, I, maybe I'm uh, thinking of an earlier panel I did today, but forgive me if I get this wrong. Uh, you may have said I'm a Keynesian or I think of myself as a Keynesian. No, this was another panel. <laughs> okay, it was the other panel, okay. So, we will uh, talk later about that. <laughs> okay. Well, so look, the, the reality is that governments have to share spending space with all other spenders in the economy. I wanna spend money, my neighbor wants to spend money, my employer wants to spend money, the state of New York wants to spend money, all the businesses, right? We, we all want to take some spending space. We want command of some goods and services. And so the government has to share space with everybody else who wants to spend into the US economy. And so, you know, sometimes I will tell people, look, I've, I've got to, let's say that this is an empty 12 ounce glass. Okay, Let, let's just suppose it's 12 ounce. I don't know what it is. If it's a 12 ounce cup and it's empty and I bring a 12 ounce can of you know, soda into the room unopened, I know that I can crack that soda open and I can start pouring into this glass and I can safely get every drop of liquid into this cup without flowing over. Now, if I pour too fast, even though I've got 12 ounces of space, I could still create problems, right? By spending too much in one part of the economy, but I can watch what I'm doing and I can pull back and I can wait for the foam to subside. I can add more, I can get it all in. Say so the economy is not that nice and tidy. I can't look through my binoculars and see the fiscal space in the economy. I can't see productive capacity. The best I can do is take the economy's temperature through time. Are we getting hot in this occupation, in this industry? Is there capacity for government to do infrastructure or to do education or to do some R&D or to do, and, and to get a sense through time, what if I did policy X? Do I need to offset that spending? What if I cut taxes? Do I need some offset? Or am I gonna leave people with so, you know, am I gonna leave people with so much additional purchasing power that they turn around and spend into an economy and push inflation higher? So it is an art, not a perfect science because we can't see clearly where the limits lie. We know that there are limits. And what we have to do is, is get better and better at modeling the fiscal space and helping lawmakers, helping our lawmakers um, make good decisions, right? Before authorizing big ambitious new spending programs, they need guidance. They need help understanding when the offsets are needed, when they're not necessary, and what kind of offsets to choose 
to match with their spending to mitigate inflation risk. So, you know, we used to be pretty good at that. There was a time, there, there was a time in the 40s and the 50s into the 60s when economists actually played a useful role, right? They, they actually did this kind of work, working with business industry leaders and other experts, uh, managing inflationary risks and thinking about the budgeting process differently today the only question that lawmakers really think about is, does it add to the deficit or not? If it doesn't add to the deficit, they assume that it's safe to spend more. And MMT says, that's not really the important question. The important question is the inflation risk. So, but uh, what you said now means um, because of this comp that, that the macroeconomy of the economy of a, of, an, of a nation is more difficult than your cup. Um, that we cannot really know. So when when we are producing inflation, we will see it when we have already produced it. That is the problem, isn't it? No, so, so here, a couple of things. First of all, I think it is really important to recognize, like let's have a little humility, right? Hubris is not useful and humility is important. And economists are getting better at mm -hmm. coming to terms with the reality, which is they don't have a model of inflation. No economist on earth that I'm aware of can write down for you right now today, a model of where what causes inflation, right? Here's the model. And it will work in every country in all times and places. This is the, this is the model that explains inflation. No one has such a thing. The Federal Reserve will tell you, right, members of the Board of Governors, we do not know how to think about inflation. We don't know what causes it. We think we can manage it. We're put in charge of it, right, controlling and managing inflation, but we honestly have no idea. We've been trying to start inflation for more than a decade. The Bank of Japan's been trying for three decades. It's not like there's a little dial at the central bank that they can turn up and down to make inflation happen or not. So that's the first thing to recognize. But do we have some understanding of you know, the fact that we construct a price index and then we say, these are the items we put in the basket. We weight the items this way. We choose human you know, statisticians, the people who build the CPI and the PCE and so forth. They put the thing together. They decide what goes in, how to weight those uh, items. And we, we know that you can get headline inflation, right? Core inflation moving up because energy prices go very high, while everything else doesn't change in price, or housing, or health care. Or so you can have top line inflation, but you got to look under the hood and say, what's driving that inflationary pressure? And more often than not, any inflation that you're observing is disconnected from the tightness of the labor market. Right? It's not about how hot you're running the economy, how low unemployment has moved, how much you've closed the output gap or whatever. It's something else that is driving that headline rate higher. So, you know, I, I sometimes say, like, if I go downstairs after we finish here and I see that my basement is flooded with water, like, oh dear, I got a problem, right? My basement is flooded with water. I don't know where to run. I don't know if one of my kids left the faucet running. I don't know if a toilet overflowed, a pipe burst, the dishwasher's leaking. Before I can fix the problem, I have to know what's causing the problem. And inflation is the same way. Before you can know how to fight the inflationary pressure, you have to know what's driving it, right? And so you need, I think, um, a more nuanced and sophisticated understanding of inflation. It can't just simply be uh, a uh, inflation expectations of Phillips curve. It can't be a quantity theory of money. It can't be all of that 150 year old stuff that doesn't work, right? We need to do better. And so we could talk the whole time just about inflation, um, but that's my opening salvo. Okay, yeah, I, I don't want to talk too much about inflation because I want to talk uh, about uh, uh, other things too. Uh, for example, for uh, about that uh, national debts. Uh, so you you talked already about that uh, that uh, a sovereign currency issuing country 
um, doesn't have any restraints uh, technic in a technical sense or in a financial sense because it's their money and they can issue. Um, so that's for sure right. But you all the time say uh, the government can produce the money. In fact, uh, in the most modern economies, uh, the institutions are separated. There you have the national government and there you have the, uh, uh, the, the central bank. Uh, and it's the central bank and not the government. And for sure they are interconnected, but they are also separated by counting. Uh, so if the, uh, if the central bank is twirling money to the economy and uh, also stimulating that the government can spend, it's usually con connected with the fact that national debt is rising. Uh, so is it totally uh, irrelevant how high uh, the uh, government debt is? 100% of GDP, 170% of GDP, 980% of GDP, is this irrelevant? Or is there, is there, a, is there a limit uh, where you would say uh, uh, the, the national debt uh, isn't irrelevant anymore? Or would you say we should change the way we account that? All right. So look, I, I think that we should have a conversation maybe about this idea of, it, it sounds like you didn't use the phrase central bank independence or something, but yeah. you were sort of uh, alluding to that. Look, as I said earlier, when Congress writes the CARES Act, it is sending a set of instructions to its fiscal agent, to the central bank. Get ready. We're ordering 2.2 trillion and you're going to make the payments on our behalf. That is exactly how it works. The, the Fed cannot say to Congress, oh, no, we're not. We will not be making those payments that you've authorized. They are Congress's fiscal agent. When I say the government, I mean Congress and the executive and the central bank. OK, because they do work as one. And if you go back, you know, there's great video of Alan Greenspan from the Wayback Machine. This must be from the 1980s. Right. And Alan Greenspan gets a question about uh, the so-called consolidated government budget. And somebody is asking him, well, you know, are you really one or are you separate? And he says, we're one. And he said the he said Congress can basically he said the government can uh run any deficit it chooses simply by, these are his words, simply by printing bonds and making sure that they sell in the marketplace. And then he goes on to say, and we are involved in that process. So in the US context, we have primary dealer market. So when the government runs a deficit, bond, bonds are sold and they are first taken up in a primary dealer market where the primary dealers are about two dozen uh, financial institutions whose job it is to make the market for US government bonds, right? They have to bid and they have to bid their fair share. And the Fed backstops the primary dealer market. So it's all one big intertwined hand in glove working together uh, to, to accommodate, right? Uh, the financing for whatever Congress authorizes. So that's the first point. Um, the second question was, what was your, the second point? Your second? Is it irrelevant? Uh, uh, the debt, the debt the ratio. Of the bond means okay. that the government debt is uh, in, in a, it has, a, has a number. Is it irrelevant how high it is? Let, let's do a thought experiment. Okay, people talk about uh, helicopter drops and people get very confused, right? About quantitative easing and Fed, central banks dropping money, helicopter drops. What if central, what if treasury dropped bonds from the sky. This is a thought experiment, right? And you said 900% of GDP. Okay, let's imagine that bonds start raining down on the population, okay? And so we pick them up and now they're on our balance sheets. So our wealth increases by whatever the number of bonds we have just uh, been delivered. And if there's a coupon, there's an interest payment coming to me. Every year, I'm going to get my $20 or my $50 per bond, whatever, you know, this, this thing is holding. So the question is, okay, I've increased the net worth of the non-government sector, right? Savings, my wealth is higher. And now I have a cash flow payment if we assume I'm getting uh, an interest payment associated with those. So what do I do with the interest? If I just leave it and let it accumulate in my bank account, nothing happens, right? I just accumulate the interest. 
and over time my wealth grows and that's it. If I spend, right, if I spend the interest income into the economy and so does everybody else, well, that's like fiscal stimulus. So now I'm chasing goods and services. The question is, is it inflationary, right? So again, for, for MMT, it always comes back to, it's not these arbitrary limits. There's no tipping point that we would say at 250% or 400%. It's about the effects of the spending, not the, the sheer ratio itself is, um, is unimportant, right? Is, un, is uninteresting on its own. Uh, you touched already that that what you are uh, uh, talking about here it really fits for only for the U.S., for Australia, for uh, for Great Britain, for uh, for, for Japan um, and other countries, and not for countries uh, that have, for example. Uh, Uh, no sovereignty about the currency or have to land on the capital markets in foreign currencies. Uh, and the question is now, uh, what's with the European Union and especially with the Eurozone? As we all know, um, we are in a way sovereign countries. And on the other hand, we are using money. We are not sovereign issuing. Uh, we are something in between um, uh, these two types. Uh, do you think that the Modern monetary theory idea is possible for the uh, for the Euro eurozone in in, the, in this way organized. Yeah, look. Uh, so I started writing, um, you know, getting involved in the MMT project in the mid '90s, '96, '97, something like that. And the euro was, of course, introduced in January of 1999. As part of my dissertation, which I was writing in 98, 97, 98, uh, I was writing already about the Euro. And there were people like Wynne Godley, who was, you know, uh, head of the Department of Applied Economics at Cambridge University and then became a scholar at the Levy Institute and, and served on my uh, committee, my, my doctoral committee. Um, so MMT always applied in the sense that MMT is that macro framework, it's the lens. So from an MMT perspective, you know, using the MMT lens, Godley and later I and others were able to see the Euro project, the Maastricht Treaty, the Euro project as something that was essentially had this design flaw, right? that in separating the fiscal and the monetary authorities, we were able to see where most economists just said, oh, this is great. This is just an efficiency thing, right? It reduces transactions uh, costs and eliminates exchange rate risk. And it's just a more efficient way. If you have one kind of one market, you should have one money. Uh, and Godley and, and Charles Goodhart, who was you know, uh, an economist in, in Britain and a monetary policy maker and so forth. And he said, no, no, no one nation, one money, not one market, one money. So we were already thinking about the problems that would arise when financial markets figured out that they were no longer lending to governments that were sovereign in their currency, but in fact, lending to countries that had given up their monetary sovereignty and turned themselves into currency users. So in 2010, when the debt crisis really gripped, you know, periphery countries in Europe, uh, Randy Ray and I co-authored a piece together for the Levy Institute, a policy uh, uh, report. And the piece was called, Can Euroland Survive? Can Euroland Survive? And we answered in the affirmative. Yes, it can. Yes, if, right? And we laid out a, a series of ifs. So the last thing I'll say is this. Um, in 2010, it took a long time for the, the currency issuer, for the ECB, to exercise its considerable power to bring yields down and stabilize conditions, right? Uh, you know, to stamp out the debt crisis. This time, it didn't take so long. Christine Lagarde, in last, right? In the last half year, yeah. Yeah, so you have the emergency pandemic purchase program, you have a suspension of the stability and growth pact rules. And, and so Italy is sitting at what, 160% debt to GDP ratio? and the 10-year Italian bond is below 1%, it's, it's incredible. What has been, what's been done 
effectively is that the ECB has restored monetary sovereignty temporarily for the countries in the Eurozone. They said, the ECB has said to countries, spend, run deficits. We got you, we got your back. We're not gonna let yields blow out, do what you have to do. And so Italy, Spain, and other countries are able to carry these deficits without the punishing interest rates. So they've kind of got their money, they've got their fiscal space back, but you know, for how long? That's the question. Uh, um, the counter argument would be that the ECB is doing this since let's say 2013, 2014. Uh, with beginning from the moment that you make clear that no eurozone country will go bankrupt whatever it takes yeah i know so so you got draghi with yeah. whatever it takes but then you also had lagarde say it's not our job to manage spreads mm -hmm. and spreads began to diverge and then she walked it back and now you're seeing it so what i'm saying is there hasn't been a full-throated commitment to playing that role for the ECB to play the role as is, is effectively backstopper of the bond market writ large um, for member governments, uh, because it's been this sort of tepid well, and now we want to see you begin to fall back in line hitting the criteria, the stability and growth pact and so forth. So look, um, I, I, I just think that right now, most of the world's advanced economies are able to behave as monetary sovereigns. I, I, I actually I have ten more questions, but I have to hurry because I, we will also give the audience the possibility to have some questions in the last uh, fifteen minutes. So I will reduce my questions to two questions. The first question you already. Um, um, expected it uh, from the other from the other panel. Uh, if we if we the, the the problems we talked about now and the problems we are in, there will be there would be the general traditional Keynesian answer uh, to all the calamities we are in. First, government should trigger investment uh, to raise the economic activities um, to the level of the capacities, as you as you talked about. Second, you cannot save out of a crisis. You have to invest out of a crisis. Third, with central banks and federal governments um, that cannot run in bankruptcy, uh, we have the instruments to do so. Uh, don't care about the deficits, care about employment, then the deficit will care about themselves, and so on. So what is the real difference between your perspective and the traditional Keynesian perspective? Oh, there are so many. Uh, if, if you are a traditional Keynesian economist reading my book, then I think you will, um, won't turn very many pages before you find something that is, you know, runs counter to what, you know, you've long taught your students or uh, long written about and so forth. I mean, look, one of the most basic is uh, the basis of chapter four in the book, which is crowding out. You know, the, the traditional Keynesian argument is what? Is put forward in ISLM terms, mm -hmm. right? That is the mainstream Keynesian, well, and it's grown into DSG and other things, but there are still headline mainstream Keynesians who, you know, their workhorse model is the ISLM framework. And in quote unquote normal times with an upward sloping LM curve, any uh, outward shift in the IS curve, fiscal policy, fiscal expansion, pushes interest rates higher. You get deficits, push interest rates higher. MMT says no, deficits drive interest rates to zero. Only something artificial intervention can maintain a positive rate. Okay, that's at the short end. Higher interest rates uh, crowd out investment because investment is a function of interest rates. Well, even Keynes didn't say that, right? For Keynes, it was the marginal efficiency of capital and it was profit expectations overwhelmingly uh, above and beyond interest rates that mattered. So MMT is more like Keynes than Keynesians in mm -hmm. how we think about investment. Um, when it comes to monetary policy, most mainstream Keynesians believe that monetary policy is the right tool to dominate 
They believe in central bank dominance, not fiscal dominance. They want monetary policy to bear primary responsibility for managing uh, economic conditions and the business cycle and so forth. Fiscal policy is that thing that sits on the wall behind the glass that says break in case of emergency. You can use it, but only when monetary policy is out of firepower. When you hit the zero bound or whatever, then a Keynesian will say, oh, it's time for fiscal policy. We can do a little bit, prime the pump, put it back on the wall behind the glass. Um, I mean, I, I can go on and on and on with the, the differences. I just, okay, it, it didn't work. Maybe I should have done it other, the other way around uh, if, if there aren't 80% the same and 20% difference. But uh, uh, it's, it's also not the most important question. I just wanted to, uh, to put it. This last question for me would be uh, at that point, uh, the most, uh, let's, uh, let's call it the most uh, debated idea and direct proposal uh, you bring in the book and uh, in, your, in your work is that of a, a public job guarantee uh, for everybody who loses his job to fight uh, unemployment, but also to uh, uh, to give the people income, to give the people the, the possibilities to uh, to, um, uh, to to work on their ta talents and so on. Um, can you? I just want you to to talk a little bit about the idea of a, of a, a public job guarantee and uh, how, why you think this is possible under the circumstances of a of a contemporary system. Okay, so there's another big difference between MMT and the mainstream, whether it's Keynesian or not, um, perspective. Mainstream Keynesians believe in a natural rate of unemployment. There is a Nairu, there is you know, some level of unemployment that you need to maintain in the system for the, for the sake of avoiding accelerating inflation. MMT rejects that, okay? So we think that instead of relying on a buffer stock of unemployed people, literally using unemployed people to fight inflationary pressure, that you can use an employed buffer stock of people, that people, you can have what is like a public option in the labor market or what Hyman Minsky called an employer of last resort. So for Minsky, this, this idea for Minsky goes back way before, like in the 1960s, right? So Minsky said, I, I think maybe a lot of your viewers or listeners are probably familiar with the work of Hyman Minsky. I think he was I don't, one of I, I, I do not assume that, the, that most uh, of them are. So, so we I have a that, general uh, audience uh, which is interested in this question. Okay, so I think that Minsky was one of the most important economists of the last century. And Minsky was really someone who um, did most of his writing on finance and banking and the financial system, okay? So Minsky's looking at the economy, the macroeconomy, the financial system, and he says, okay, we have a central bank. We invented the Federal Reserve because we had uh, you know, all these banking panics and financial crises. And what we need is an institution that can be the lender of last resort that can keep the financial system liquid. So we have a lender of last resort that keeps the financial system always liquid enough to function, right? To not seize up. And what we don't have though, is an analogous um, institution to deal with the labor market. And he said, we should have, like we have a lender of last resort, we should have an employer of last resort. The employer of last resort job would be to keep the labor market sufficiently liquid. How do you do that? Well, if you've got 20 million people unemployed, many of them long-term unemployed, right? A half a year or longer, their skills atrophy. The longer you remain unemployed, the more you become unemployable. So Minsky said, basically, you know, people just rot away sitting in unemployment. So what we could do is keep the labor market liquid, by allowing the federal government to provide paid employment, right? The government writes the check and um, a job is created for anyone who wants to work but can't find a job anywhere else in the economy. They can have work in the public service employment program and the job can be funded by the federal government. Um, it is counter cyclical so that when the economy uh, 
is weak and people are losing jobs, they can transition into a new job immediately rather than becoming unemployed. Their income is stabilized because they have work instead of unemployment. Uh, they can have their skills upgraded, they can have education or training in the program, and they stay ready, right? A liquid pool from which the private sector can then hire as the economy recovers. They reach in and they get an employed worker at a small markup over whatever wage is being paid in that program. So you have a liquid pool of employed people and it works to cushion the economy through the business cycle. So in the downturn, the number of people in the program increases and in the upswing, the number of people in the program decreases. So it's targeted spending. It works like an automatic stabilizer, it keeps the labor market liquid and creates effectively a perfectly elastic demand curve for labor at a fixed wage. So that's your price anchor. So you get the price stabilizing effects, but with full employment. And so it's superior to what we have today, which is trying to fight inflation with unemployment. So maybe you are interested uh, uh, in, in the fact, uh, I just uh, put, uh, uh, mentioned it here, uh, that the Austrian Federal uh, uh, Labor Service, which is the federal institution who managed the labor market, um, uh, in the last months ago or two months ago started an experiment uh, in a region in Austria with, uh, let's say, 200,000 people are living, uh, where they, uh, uh, the experiment with the public job guarantee. So the, all the people living in this region have now the uh, public job guarantee for maybe some two years, or I don't know, one year, two years, and then you will look how it, uh, uh, how it figures out. Um, for sure, it's only a, a region, so you can, it's not real, it's, uh, but it will be an interesting um, experiment. Uh, oh, so maybe- I, Let me ask you about that because I, I just read a piece a couple of days ago about this new program. And as I understand it, this is not a job guarantee of the kind I was just describing. This is a commitment to um, place unemployed people in some kind of work where there's sort of an ordering, right? The first thing is you subsidize private sector employment. This is, the, this is the description of the program as I read it. So the government is subsidizing private employers to take these unemployed people and give them jobs for a period of time. Now, that, <laughs> that may work for some subset of the unemployed, but I doubt very much that it's going to result in everyone who wants a job but can't find one getting subsidized employment because employers hire because they have to, not because they want to, not because you make it. So if I'm, if, and then I'm, I'm, as I you go down- You are right. I don't think you are right. And maybe it's also, it's a mixed system that uh, these that people have to guarantee to get a job and if they get it, uh, uh, on a subsidized way in a private company, it's okay. And if they get it in a sub sub subsidized Correct. way in a public sphere, it, it's also a, okay. The general thing is that everybody who is uh, without job in this region uh, has the guarantee that there will be a job for him. And it also means that all the people who uh, are in the region unemployed uh, and do not really want at the moment to work, uh, they are out of this uh, u usual uh, usual institutional pressure uh, to find a job if they do not do not want you. That, that's the that's the other side of the usual uh, uh, labor market service uh, how it works in Austria. And so I I, I think it's it's. It's a, it's a little bit a little bit more. I don't know to every details, but I think it's a little bit more in the direction you want. Uh, you talk. You think about. Uh, we'll see. As, I as think you... that the it, it read to me like the last the last thing to happen would be that the federal government pays someone to do a job that they invent themselves. Mm -hmm. That you know, then that's very different from. What I was describing, the job guarantee program is the jobs are on the shelf. They're designed. They're ready to go. You walk in unemployed to an office and say, I want a job and someone fits you. They match you to an available job. This read to me like, you mean nobody wants to hire you? Okay, decide what you want to do with your time and we'll pay you. 
So I don't know. Uh, it will be interesting to see how how it works. But it, it I just want to be careful that it isn't uh, what we've proposed or what I talk about in the book. Okay, thank you, Stephanie, for this wonderful talk in the last 50 minutes. And now we have uh, some 10 minutes left uh, for questions to put forward. I just saw already some, um, for example, the question about uh, the, the independence of the European uh, uh, Central Bank and the different architecture we already touched. But I now give to uh, my colleague Jutta Pichel. Do we have some other questions you want to cluster here? Uh, yes, there are actually a lot of questions for you, Ms. Carlton. Um, the first one is about how you um, or if you are concerned about the backlash by the austerity preachers as soon as we are past this pandemic and how to prepare best for that. Yes, I'm concerned about that. I think um, few things concern me more, frankly, in the current environment. You know, we repeating the mistakes of the 2009-2010 sort of after the financial crisis, um, you know, the Great Recession, Congress passed what was then thought to be a pretty big spending bill. It was called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It was uh, some $787 billion to, that, to people at the time. It sounded like a lot of money. It wasn't nearly enough. We got one bill and then we really didn't get anything else. And everybody began to worry about the deficit and the increasing debt and Congress just withdrew fiscal support. And in fact, they didn't just withdraw fiscal support, we went into austerity mode. And that ended up um, taking the wind, right? The tailwind from the recovery and turning it into a headwind. So it took us some seven years to claw back all of the jobs that were lost after the financial crisis. We had a slow um, and very anemic recovery. Wage growth was tepid. It, it, it took a very long time. So my big concern is, you know, okay, what are we gonna do this time? Are we going to do better or are we going to allow the increased deficit, you know, this $3.1 trillion deficit that uh, we ran this year to start to get us anxious about continuing with fiscal support and passing another relief package and doing everything that's necessary to lay a foundation for a sustainable recovery. If we withdraw fiscal support too soon, uh, we're gonna end up like we did last time, right? We'll dip back down, I think. We, we, we'll go back into contraction at some point next year. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll be inflicting, it's just self-inflicted harm, you know? So yeah, that's the big concern for me. Okay, thank you for the answer. I will stay with um, concerns. The next question is on cryptocurrencies and how do you um, estimate the impact of cryptocurrencies? And if you think the threat to the, um, for the trust in fiat money, as long as they're not accepted for tax paying, et cetera. As long as they're not accepted, no, I don't think they're a threat to fiat currencies to the extent that governments perceive them to be undermining the, the goals of, uh, of governments in terms of their ability to provision themselves using the monetary system. Uh, governments will take steps to ensure that crypto does not undermine government uh, capacity and, and dominance of the um, fiat money system. So you're already seeing this, right? You're already seeing central banks uh, with central bank digital currency. If the, if the concern is anonymity and, you know, speed of payment and so forth, they're, they're replicating um, those sorts of features and doing it through a state currency system. So no, I don't, um, I don't believe that crypto is going to upend uh, government fiat currency systems because governments are very powerful and um, they're not going to allow that to happen. Okay, so now the last question on your concerns or your possible concerns. It's about your thoughts on distrib distributional concern and about the argument that the government might overinvest all the money. Might overinvest? Yes. I, I guess you. I guess the person means overspend. Okay, yeah. um, probably. Look, all evidence to the contrary. Look around the world. Where where is this happening? The the greatest threat 
by far is the governments do too little, not too much. Okay. Um, I forgot. Can you say again the first part of the question? Um, your thoughts on distributional concerns. Yeah. Okay. So look, every deficit is good for someone. That is like fundamental. Recognize that every deficit is good for someone. Why do I say that? Because a deficit simply means that the government is adding more dollars to balance sheets than it is subtracting away, right? So if they spend 100 in and they only tax 90 out, we say the government has run a deficit, right? We write a minus 10 on the government ledger. But recognize that if they put 100 in and only take 90 out, somebody gets 10. So the government's deficit is always, always a financial contribution to some other part of the economy. It is a deposit that they're making somewhere. So every deficit is good for someone. The question is for whom, right? Who gets that 10? So when you talk about distributional effects, yeah, I care very much about that. You look at the tax cuts that were passed in the US in December of 2017, those tax cuts cost an estimated $1.9 trillion, right? Spread over 10 years, call it 2 trillion. So it's a $2 trillion tax cut that went to whom, right? It's a, it's a big increase in the deficit. Every deficit is good for someone. That deficit, those tax cuts went overwhelmingly, the windfall to people in the top 1% of the income distribution. 83% of the benefits of the personal income tax cut went to the richest people in the country, top 1%. So we used a $2 trillion deficit to give a windfall to people at the very top. Then we did the CARES Act, 2.2 trillion. That was the bill. So again, it's a roughly $2 trillion deficit. Every deficit is good for someone who benefited from the CARES Act spending. Well, a lot of folks, but if you got that $1,200 check, you benefited. If you were unemployed and you received an extra $600 a week, $2,400 a month in extra unemployment compensation, you benefited. If you were a small business that was struggling to hang on through the lockdown and so forth, you benefited. You applied for a loan that became a grant. You kept your workers on payroll. You got money to help you with your fixed expenses and so forth. So a very different way to use a $2 trillion increase in the deficit that has uh, clearly different distributional implications. So um, distribution matters. Okay, great. Um, looking at the time, I want to pass on one more question because we're running out of time. Um, this one is um, following up the things you just said. It is about if raising taxes is, um, politically speaking, how, how hard or how easy it is, and who or to whom um, the taxes should be raised, for whom the taxes should be raised. Okay, we, 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 somehow we have managed to pretend that it's impossible to raise taxes. And it is not. President Obama raised taxes. President Reagan raised taxes. President George H.W. Bush raised taxes. Bill Clinton raised taxes. Governments raise taxes. It's not an impossibility, okay? Um, on whom should taxes increase and for what reason? So there is a, a misconception out there that MMT is about, um, you know, pushing spending very high, triggering inflation, and then coming around on the back end and trying to fight inflation by raising taxes. That is not the MMT program, okay? That's not what it's about. In fact, for MMT, we, we say the best defense against inflation is a good offense. You don't wanna fight inflation after you create the problem. You want to carefully evaluate inflation risk associated with any new spending before you vote for it, before you authorize it. So I worked in the Senate and I worked as the chief economist for the Democrats on the budget committee. So, you know, this is the committee that writes the federal budget, right? They draft a budget. And I can tell you that in the time I worked on the budget committee, I never heard a member of the United States Senate or a staffer ever talk about inflation or inflation risk. Is that insane? That, that you are writing a four, four and a half trillion dollar budget and inflation doesn't come into the picture at all? Why? 
because they don't have to think about it because they just assume that that's the Fed's job, right? Central banks do inflation stuff. We just write budgets. And so what MMT says is, look, you got to you got to change the way you approach the, the spending piece and the federal budgeting process before you go out authorizing a big new program, a big new green deal, infrastructure investment, whatever it is, you have to be held accountable for evaluating the inflation risk before you vote to authorize that spending. Somebody should be evaluating the bill that you're writing to say, have you mitigated the inflation risk? Did, you, did anybody stop and think, will this spending trigger inflationary pressures if we move forward? And what I'm saying is we don't do that today. That, that isn't part of the calculus. And so MMT is asking us to do better, to be more fiscally responsible in the way that we approach the budgeting process to replace the, the artificial revenue constraint, right? With a real resource constraint, with an inflation constraint. And so we are better protected as Congress thinks about, you know, big new spending programs. We want somebody um, evaluating that proposed spending for inflation risk and, and making sure that when offsets are needed, right, when the capacity isn't there to safely absorb all of that new spending and the offsets become important, that somebody's getting the offsets right so that you avoid the inflation, not that you fight it after you create it, but that you avoid it ex ante. So great, thank you very much for your um, detailed answers and for okay. talking to us. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thanks for letting me spend some time with you. Uh, thank you also from my side, uh, Stephanie, for this passionate and convincing hour. And uh, also for the audience, this book is in the same way convincing and passionate um, and also very readable also for people who are not, uh, not experts in the field. Um, and uh, the deficit myths. Uh, uh, I, I assume that there will be a German issue in the next time, but not till yet. There is one. Um, is there is there a German issue planned? I don't know if there's a German. There are so many foreign yeah. editions that I'm yeah. not sure. But you know, there there's a Dutch edition. There's a Spanish edition. There's a Polish edition. There's an Italian edition. There's a. I, I, I okay. don't, off the top of my head, I'm kind of inclined to say that maybe we have not uh, sold German rights. And I, I'm not sure, but I, I think they might, there might not be one. So the Austrians can read in the English uh, okay. edition or the Italian edition. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I think it's not so, that's not the problem. Wonderful to have you here. We in the Kreisky Forum, uh, I say this now to the audience, uh, we, we stay on the issue in a way and in nine days on this 27th of November, um, 27th November, we will have here our friend from Germany, the German uh, uh, Secretary of State for, um, for, for Labour, the Arbeits- und Sozialminister Hubertus Heil, and we will talk with him for sure about uh, the corona crisis, labor markets, and how to, uh, which per perspectives we have to come out of the crisis and to solve the, the employment crisis. Am 27. November, um 19 Uhr, nicht mit wie diesmal um 20 Uhr, um 19 Uhr, wieder hier bei Kreisky Forum Digital. Thank you very much who uh, watched uh, uh, the audience on the different platform. Thank you, Stephanie Kelton, for the this hour and 10 minutes, I think, <laughs> uh, you had for us uh, now. And thank you very much and have a wonderful day uh, still in New York. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Bye. Thanks to everybody who joined. Stay safe. Thanks so much. Bye. Stay safe bye too. Bye. bye.